y'all. Coach in the fight here. Guys, stay with me. Shalom. And in today's class, we're going to be talking about how the third temple will be constructed on Passover of the year 2021. Okay, I don't really um, know a lot about the third temple. Um, I do know that it is within us, but I am here to learn. Yep, we're talking about that spiritual temple, not necessarily the brick and mortar temple that man is fascinated with over there in Jerusalem. We're talking about the Lord's temple. We're talking about the third temple, that temple that's built on the heart and conscience of humanity. Okay. And in this class, like I said, we're going to show you particularly how it's going to be constructed in Passover of the year 2021. What makes that date? Um, so specific other than any other time only because we're in 2021 okay. we're going to learn here that it's not the year that matters it's actually the Passover that matters and there will be a lot of people who will be celebrating Passover for the first time in the year 2021 and for those people the temple will be constructed for them in the year 2021 yeah, as we fastly go through time, more and more people are coming into the knowledge that we should be celebrating Passover opposed to Easter. And I think this Passover will um, be a time where many, many, many people will be celebrating it for the first time. And I guess that's one thing that's very significant about the year 2021 is that Easter will not trample upon the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You know, sometimes we use the word Passover and unleavened bread interchangeably, but the high holy feast is the feast of unleavened bread, that week long feast that starts the day after Passover. That's the main feast. That's the major feast. Passover is really just a preparatory day, the day in which you prepare for the first day of unleavened bread. But the thing about unleavened bread, we are required to remove all leaven out of our house. And we learned over in the New Testament that the leaven is the doctrine of the church, which includes Easter Sunday. And so the thing about the year 2021, Easter doesn't fall anywhere close to Passover. Yeah, this um, these two feasts are unlike any of the other feasts where they fall back to back, right? Um, so it is... Um, reasonable to think that people will well I at one time thought that the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover were the same feast yeah they're actually different in that you do different things and they're fall on different days the thing about 2021 like we were saying because Easter fell in the month of March and Passover or Unleavened Bread falls in the month of April you won't stamp out your efforts like it did in the previous years I believe that the scripture is telling us that if somehow during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we allow that leaven in our house, we allow that church doctrine into our house, it defiles our feast day. It actually destroys our efforts. So we will be taking out the um, self-rising flour and the yeast, but we also will remove lots and lots, well, not many, books that... Um, contain leaven. Yeah, because we don't want anything church doctrine to infiltrate us at all during that feast day. But anyway, we're getting a little bit off topic here, so let's focus back on what today's lesson is about. And for it, we're coming out of the book called The Epistle of Barnabas. Okay. This book has a wealth of information, especially when it comes to understanding a lot of the things that went on in the Old Testament, like... Um, the meanings behind the Sabbath days, the meaning behind the sacrificial offerings, the meaning even behind the dietary laws. So this book would be found in, is it the lost books? Yep, this book is actually found in the lost books of the Bible. So let's jump all the way down to verse 16 so we can start to understand how the third temple will be constructed for a lot of people in the year 2021. Okay. Verse 16, let us inquire, therefore, whether there be any temple of God. Yes, there is. And there where himself declares that he would both make and perfect it. For it is written, and it shall be, that as soon as the week shall be completed, 
the temple of the Lord shall be gloriously built in the name of the Lord. Now, I will suggest you guys read this entire chapter. It's all really all about the Sabbath day and the third temple. But we wanted to keep this video short, so we're starting all the way down here in verse 16. But if you look at the previous verses, it's talking about the second temple and how the promises of it being destroyed were fulfilled. But let's unpack this verse 16 a little bit here. It says, let us inquire, therefore, whether there be any temple of God. So he just finished talking about the second temple being destroyed in verse 15. And now in verse 16, he's saying, well, is there a temple at all? Mm -hmm. The temple has been destroyed. Right. There's a, now, this is the reason why a lot of people don't keep feast days is because they say we don't have a third temple. Right. They say we don't have a temple at all, so we can't do the feast days at all. And so the question of Barnabas' action here is, is there a temple? Right. Mm -hmm. Because uh, during this time, this is um, the time where Paul was as well. Yeah, this is the time. As a matter of fact, Paul and uh, Barnabas were together there. It was Barnabas that actually prevented Paul from getting killed by the Jews. It's that same Barnabas that we hear about in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it goes on to say, yes, there is. And there were himself declares that he would both make and perfect it. So it's talking about our spiritual temple. Okay. Matter of fact, let's jump over to the New Testament right quick. And let's touch on a few verses that talks about this spiritual temple. First of all, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you would read verse 16. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So this is one of the places that we find out that the third temple would actually be a spiritual temple. It would be inside of us. Okay, now when we read this, a lot of times people think that we're talking about the body, right? Yes. Okay, so it says that no... You not that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Okay, so it's talking about the body here. Yeah. Matter of fact, if we come over to Clarence Larkin's chart of the three different tabernacles or the three different temples, he kind of gives us an idea of what this third temple would look like. With the outer court being the body and the inner court being the soul and the holy of holies being the spirit. Okay. Right. So that's what Paul is talking about. Now, let's come over here and let's look what John had to say about the spiritual temple. If you would read verse 22. You worship. You know, not what we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. OK, go on to 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh such to worship him. So it's really always been about a spiritual temple. The one thing about the first temple or Solomon's temple is that during a dedication process, Solomon said a very significant prayer related to that temple and the significance of that temple. And our father answered that prayer by saying that he would place his name on that temple. Okay. But when you read through that, one can read it as though it was only because of Solomon's prayer that that temple gained that level of significance. Hmm. Right. But it doesn't say that it actually took away from the spiritual temple at all. Right. But anyway, let's get back on course over here. Looking at verse 23, it says the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit. Right. And so this is what Paul is talking about when he's talking about the temple being in our bodies is that we are actually worshiping him through spiritual means. Right. And that there's no need to go, you know, to a brick and mortar temple or halfway around the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Or even build another temple on this side of the world. Yeah. We have one in our bodies. Read verse 24. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Like verse 23 says, Father seeketh such to worship him. And, you know, we read about that all in the Third Testament, how he wants us to worship him in spirit. Right. He wants us to pray in the spirit. 
He wants us to meditate in the spirit. He wants us to spend time with him in the spirit and not necessarily in a materialistic form like we've grown up doing. Right, and we can find that over in the Third Testament. So let's come back over to the book of Barnabas and let's work a little bit more with this verse. He says, for it is written, as it shall be that as soon as the week shall be completed, the temple of the Lord shall be gloriously built in the name of the Lord. Now, that's significant right there where he says, soon as the week shall be completed. Okay. You know which week he's talking about? Um, is he talking about the Sabbath day week? I don't, I don't know. He actually is talking about the Sabbath day week. He's talking about the 7,000 years of human history. Which started back there with the creation of Adam, and which would have been the beginning of the first day of the week. And we're seeing here that the Christ came at the beginning of the fifth day or the beginning of year 5000. And here we are now about to start the 7000th year. So we've actually completed the work week portion and we're actually about to go into the rest period or that rest day for a thousand years that we hear about. So he said as soon as it is completed. So we're you're saying we're about to go into it. So as soon as it is over? No, we're here we're here at the end of the week. Okay. The week is the week we're at the rest period right now. Okay. The seven thousandth year is the beginning of the rest period. And we learned that up there at the beginning of this chapter in verses about four, five, and six, where he's talking about these seven thousand years of human history. You see right there where it says, therefore, children in six days, that is in six thousand years, shall all things be accomplished. Mm -hmm. That's what he's talking about. The end of that week. OK. Matter of fact, go ahead and read verse six. And what is that? He said, and he rested the seventh day. He meaning this, that when his son shall come and abolish the season of the wicked one and judge the ungodly and shall change the sun and the moon and the stars then he shall gloriously rest on the seventh day. So he's given a specific timing here. If we understand when exactly the sixth day is over and the seventh day begins. And we could go on into the math and of all of that, looking at when the Messiah's first coming was. All we really have to do is add another 2000 years to it. And we'll know the beginning of the seventh day or the 7000th year. But we'll save that for another class. There's really one other point that I want to bring out in this class because I believe that he's not necessarily pointing to an exact year. Like, for instance, we don't have to wait to an exact year, um, which would calculate out to be about the year 2028 before this temple is built. What he's telling us is that we're actually in this time period, the time in which this temple is being constructed on our hearts. Matter of fact, let's go on to verse 17. I find, therefore, that there is a temple, but how shall it be built in the name of the Lord? I will show you. So that's what we're really talking about here is how this temple is actually going to be constructed. And that's the significance of the title of this class is that it's going to be built on Passover. If you would read verse 18. Before that we believed in God, the habitation of our heart was corruptible and feeble. As a temple truly built with hands. So he's talking about our bodies here, right? Right. He's saying that, that our temple was corruptible. We had a temple that was feeble. Our fleshly temples was the same as if it was built by human hands. Right. Mm -hmm. Look at 19. For it was a house full of idolatry, a house of devils, inasmuch as there was done in it whatsoever was contrary unto God. But it shall be built in the name of the Lord. So again, he's talking about our bodies here. And he's talking about how our temples, our bodies, when we were born, even up until the time that he says that we believed in God, our temples was corruptible. Right. So the object of this study is how is he going to turn our corruptible bodies into his temple? Right. And this being done on Passover. And being done on Passover. All right. So let's look down in verse 20. Consider how that the temple of the Lord shall be very gloriously built and by what means that shall be. So he's about to tell us how our bodies are going to become his temple. Are you understanding the significance of this? Yeah, he's 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 
kind of building us up. And if we take this slowly, we'll understand the importance of what he's about to tell us here is he's actually going to tell us how it's going to be built, how we are going to be changed from this corruptible fleshly structure to the temple of God. Read verse 21. Having received remission of our sins and trusting in the name of the Lord, we are become renewed, being again created as it were from the beginning. Wherefore God truly dwells in our house that is in us. So you see right here how it is that this temple is being constructed. Remission of our sins and trusting in the name of the Lord. What does that do for us? Well, remission of sins is we become renewed. We become renewed, being again created, as it were, from the beginning. Now, what was it like in the beginning? Well, he says in the previous verse that we was a house full of idolatry. Uh, we was corrupt. Um, you know, the house wasn't very um, stable. It was um, as if it was built by the hands of man. Um, yeah, he's that, that's talking about you and I in our beginning. You know, about 40 or 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. But no, what he's talking about here in verse 21 is the beginning as in the time of Adam. Okay. When they were walking around in the garden and they were in the presence of the Lord, able to commune with him anytime they wanted to. Mm -hmm. That's how man was created before the sin that Adam and Eve took on. Okay. They was in this temple kind of state. Okay, so he's saying we will become renewed as... We were from the beginning when Adam and Eve were um, in the Garden of Eden. That's correct. So what he's saying here is from once we get the remission of our sins, we go back to a similar state that Adam and Eve was in before they got kicked out of the garden. Okay, so let me ask a realistic question. <laughs> so when we, we know that remission of sins mean like the counseling out of our sins, right? Yep. So, are we saying that this have happened or this hasn't happened? Or this will, we're saying that this could happen on Passover. All of that. It had, for some of us, it already has happened. For some of us, it's yet to happen. And it will happen on Passover. So, the answer is yes. So, okay. So, if I have remission of my sins... Then sometimes, you know, I have bad thoughts. Sometimes I do bad things. Um, I mean, some, you know, I don't feel like I'm being renewed or I have been renewed. Well, let's go over here and let's see what's going on in the book of Matthew. If you would read Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. See, this is how this works. It is on Passover with the wine that represents his blood. Do we get the remission of our sins every year? Okay. Mm -hmm. So the way this works is you were baptized at some point in your life. Right. And it was at that point that you got the forgiveness of your sins and you got this clean slate. You became just as you were back there in the days of Adam and Eve. But how long did that last? Mm, sometimes for many people it might last uh, minutes or hours yeah as soon as we get out of church we run back down there and dirty up our temple again well that's why our father in his infinite wisdom gave us the wine that we partake in on Passover because he knew that we would get dirty again and so we can get this remission of sins every year okay so for the person who is now in a corruptible temple, a defiled temple, a feeble temple, seeming like it's built with the hands. When they go through Passover, they will get the remission of their sins and they will go back to, like we said, a state similar to Adam and Eve. And once once they reach that state, that cleans, that purified state, then the temple will be built on their heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. What's happening is, um, what's, what seems to be happening is, once we partake in Passover, now our sins are counseled out, um, and that is because of the blood, the wine. Um, now we have the opportunity of being clean, being renewed, and 
if we fall back into sin, we wait for the next Passover? You wait for the next Passover. You, of course, you try to stay clean. But, right. you know, we've heard all the time that nobody is perfect. We're always going to do something to break one of the laws. Even if it's as simple as making a mistake and doing something on a Sabbath day and breaking the Sabbath day. Or even um, having thoughts that are contrary to the will of the Father. Anything that puts a stain on our spirit counts against us. Right. But praise our Father. This is what it means by the Messiah died for our sins is we have the Passover wine to wipe all of that away. So the Passover day is very important, um, even though we say that it's not one of the high holy feasts. It is very important because it does um, give us that opportunity to have our sins canceled out and to have the opportunity to be renewed. When you come over to the book of Revelation in chapter 7, where it's talking about the sealing of the 144,000, read verse 14. Okay. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And when do we make our robes white in the blood of the Lamb? That will be Passover. That's on Passover. So here, he, here it is talking about this multitude that no man can number. And the angel is saying, Who is all of these people? And John says, I don't know. And the angel goes on to tell him, that these are the people who partook in Passover. Mm, okay. So you're understanding the significance of that? Mm -hmm. Then look at verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. So this is how we get in the temple is to be first washed in the blood of the lamb. Mm -hmm. And the blood of the lamb is the partaking of the Passover. You remember in the old temple, it had an outer court, but it had a laver out there and you had to wash before you was able, ever able to go into the inner court. Right. Well, it is through the blood of the lamb that we get this washing done mm -hmm. and we get our washing done during Passover. Right. So the third temple, the spiritual temple will be constructed on Passover. Right. But like mm -hmm. we said, somebody has... Some of us have already gone through this as we have started partaking in Passover many years ago. And for others, this will be their first time ever getting this remission of their sins. And so for them, the construction will start to take place inside of their heart. Right. Mm -hmm. Read that verse again. Verse 21. Having received remission of our sins and trusting in the name of the Lord, we are become renewed, being again created as it were from the beginning, wherefore God truly dwells in our house that is in us. Yeah, so he's dwelling in us. Now, this part right here is important when it says trusting in the name of the Lord. Now, we can get into that in another class. It's not really saying to trust in the verbal name that we speak of so right. much as it's talking about trusting in the word of God. Right. Having faith in it. Right. And faith in the scripture. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go on to verse 22. But how does he dwell in us? By the word of his faith, the calling of his promise, the wisdom of his righteous judgment and the commands of his doctrine. He himself prophesies within us. He himself dwelleth in us and opened to us who were in bondage of death, the gate of our temple, that is, the mouth of wisdom, having given repentance unto us, and by this means has brought us to be an incorruptible temple. So there it is. That's how the third temple will be constructed. He told us he was going to tell us, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And now he's telling us flat out in plain English how this third temple will be constructed on our hearts. I'm just... Uh, because I'm not real familiar with the book of Barn Barnabas, um, I'm wondering how many people get it so confused uh, as to think that it's a, um, a t material temple when it's clearly stating and, you know, actually proving that it's a uh, spiritual temple. That actually it's because of the temple that they're going to build over there in Jerusalem that's going to start World War III. Um, you hear about Armageddon and the book of Revelation? 
Right. That it's actually a place over there. I think it's called Armageddon or something like that. And it's 30 miles from the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. It's a town, the city of Jerusalem. It's a valley called Armageddon or something like that. And that's what Revelation is talking about when it talks about the War of Armageddon and the Third World War. So it's a lot of people confused. So verse 22 tells us that um, by us partake, uh, partaking in Passover, that the Father comes in and dwells in us um, as it were from the beginning where we were renewed. And it's saying that, well, it gives us a list of things that, that, that tells us how he dwells in us. It says, by the word of his faith, and that once again so we're saying, talking about believing in the word, mm -hmm. the calling of his promise. What, is, what does that mean? The calling of his promise. Well, I would believe that the calling of his promise is the promises of the scripture. Mm -hmm. You know, the promises of the scripture are eternal life. The promises of the scripture are inheritance of the earth. Okay. The promises of the scripture are dwelling in the kingdom of heaven. Well, as we saw over there in John's revelation, that it is those who are washed in the blood of the lamb that get to go into this temple. Well, Clarence Larkin was showing us that this temple period will be this thousand year reign. So those are the promises of the Bible is the millennial age. Right. Mm -hmm. And notice that part where he says, and the commands of his doctrine. Right. That's actually pointing to the law, mm -hmm. the covenant, Exodus chapter 20, chapter 21, chapter 22 and chapter 23, which makes up the covenant. That's what he's talking about there. Because it's necessary to walk in that law. If not, you're just going to defile your temple again. Right. That's why many of us dirtied up our temples in the first place is because we weren't aware of the rules of the covenant and we immediately broke them as fast as we could. And we get the rules by reading the law. By reading the law and the law is the covenant. And we'll touch on this just briefly just to prove this point by going over to the book of Malachi chapter 4 and verse 4. Because a lot of people want to tell you that the laws are the entire book of the Torah. Mm -hmm. Or that the Torah is the entire five books of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Or that all 613 of those different rules are what's considered the law. But that's not true. I believe they only tell you that to make you think that obedience to the scripture is too hard and nobody can actually do it. Right. But when you really understand what the covenant is or what the law is, then and you go in and you read those chapters for yourself, it becomes plain and clear why it is that those rules are in the covenant and how necessary they are for our salvation. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, read verse four. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. So he's telling us specifically right here what the law is. The law is not all of the Bible. The law was given to Moses, right? Mm -hmm. It was given to Moses in Horeb. And there was only one time that the father spoke to the people from Horeb, and that was when he was giving them the covenant. And when you come over and you look at Exodus chapter 20, you see it starts off with the commandments in chapter 20. And then when you go on to chapter 21, you see the judgments. And by the time you get to chapter 23, you see the statutes, which start somewhere down in about verse 14. That's how we know exactly what our father was telling us over in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 4. So the other, um, you know, they give us, they say that there are 600 plus other laws. And we're seeing that um, they could be saying that in order to justify those which, you know, deal with sacrificing and stuff. But where were the other, where were the other laws given? We see that. Um, in Exodus, starting at 20, is when the Father gave Moses those laws um, at Horeb. Where were the other laws given? Talking about the 613 different laws? Yes. Well, they come from somebody who went in. A guy named Rambam went in and actually tried to pull out all of the laws in the Torah. And he came up with 613. 
13 different rules in there but when you look in there you see that they don't consist of rules coming from the book of Exodus but they're all over the place right they're in Leviticus they're in Genesis Deuteronomy I see and when you look closely at these 613 different rules you see that not all of them even apply to us mm -hmm. like for instance look at this one right here 444 that a Kohine shall not enter the sanctuary with this shoveled hair. So now you think that should carry the death penalty? You <laughs> no. think that, you know, you should be prevented from entering the kingdom of heaven because he didn't comb his hair when he went into the temple, into the sanctuary? Right. That's what these 613 laws are. It's everything that he could find in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at 441. To remove the ashes from the altar. So this is what they're talking about. Now, some of these rules will include the covenant rules that right. we find over there in the book of the covenant but like we said they're all over the place mm -hmm. so with these here 613 you know is no wonder people have are saying that we can no longer keep them or else we have to go to Jerusalem in order to fulfill them yeah to me it seems like they keep throwing these 613 different laws up so that we can say nobody can keep the laws look at 460 to slay the Pascal lamb. Who, who got a Pascal lamb? <laughs> who got a lamb they can go slay? Right. You know, but that's not included in, in the book of the covenant. Right. Let's do one more. Let's do one more before we get out of this. Read the last rule of the 613th rule. To destroy the seed of Amalek. You going to go do that? That means killing somebody, not. Yeah, that's exactly what it means. It means not only killing somebody, it means killing a whole group of people. Yeah, a whole yeah, a whole lineage of, of people, you know, and but that's part of the sixteen six hundred and thirteen different rules. But like I said, I believe they keep throwing these in our face to make us think that it's impossible to obey the covenant. Right. But this is not the covenant at all. The covenant is Exodus chapter twenty. <laughs> Chapter 21, chapter 22, chapter 23. And I would charge anybody and everybody to go over and read those four chapters, even all the way up to Exodus chapter 24, verse 7, so that you can see that there is absolutely no rules in the covenant that can't be followed. Mm -hmm. But anyway, let's go on. It says, he himself prophesied within us, he himself dwelled in us, and opened to us who were in bondage of death, the gate of our temple. Is that talking about our conscience? It's absolutely talking about our conscience. We learn over in the third testament of the Bible, in chapter 17 that you referenced earlier, that he speaks to us through our intuition, through our conscience, and through our dreams. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the ways we're going to know when that third temple is open to us is when we start having a lot of prophetical type dreams. Right. Mm -hmm. And when we start having a lot of intuition. Right. That's our father speaking directly to us. Mm -hmm. And when we start hearing from our conscience, like you talked about. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Looks like there are only a couple of more verses. So let's read those. He therefore that desires to be saved looketh not unto the man, but unto him that dwelleth in him. And speaketh by him, being struck with wonder, for as much as he never either heard him speaking such words out of his mouth, nor ever desired to hear them. This is that spiritual temple that is built unto the Lord. So now we know. We know how the temple is going to be constructed, and we know when it's going to be constructed. Right. Mm -hmm. When is it going to be constructed? Um, during the Feast of Passover. And for those who will be doing that for the first time, that will be when the ground will be broken. Right. That will be when the construction period will be will be started. So if this is your first time keeping Passover this year, invite us to the ground baking ceremony <laughs> down in the comment section of this video. Let us know. Right. The cutting of the ribbon. The cutting of the ribbon. We'll help you cut the ribbon. Now, before we get completely out of this class, there is a few more verses that I want to talk about. Very important verses. One of which comes out of the book of Jeremiah and chapter 38. And this is coming out of the Septuagint translation of the book of Jeremiah. But Stacy, if you would, read verse 8. Behold, I bring them from the north and will gather them from the end of the earth to the feast of the Passover. And the people shall beget a great multitude and they shall return hither. So this is talking about the regathering period. 
-hmm. But notice that it's saying that we're going to be regathered at the Feast of Passover. Right. That's supported by what we saw over in the book of Revelation chapter 7 when he said that that multitude that no man can number will have their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. Right. He's keep referring back to Passover. And another verse we'll look at right quick is over in 2 Ezra chapter 2. If you were read verse 38. Rise. Stand erect and see the number of those who have been sealed at the feast of the Lord. Now, again, this is pointing to what we saw over in the book of Revelation. Chapter 7 was all about the sealing of the 144,000, right? Right. Well, notice when they will be sealed. The feast of the Lord. At the feast of the Lord. This, again, is pointing to Passover. And we could go through a lot of more verses on this. For instance, how the other temples were mostly all dedicated on the Feast of Passover, including the first ever erected tabernacle on earth was dedicated during the feast, as well as the second temple. And then we're understanding that the third temple will be dedicated during the Feast of Passover. But for the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and close this video out. So, what do you think? Well, I'm convinced, and this book of Barnabas, I probably will go back and read starting at verse 1. Um, just to get a lot more context of it, but I'm truly convinced that he's talking about number one um, our spiritual temple and number two that we have this um, This opportunity to be renewed on the feast of Passover Well for you other guys that want to check it out We'll give you a link to it down in the description of this video. We found this over at en.wikisource.org for this particular translation and in this one you'll find it in chapter 13 but in many of the other epistles of Barnabas you'll find that same thing that we just went over in chapter 15 so you just have to look a little bit for it depending on the translation that you're in well I think that's all we wanted to talk about so I guess we'll go ahead and close this out and happy Passover happy Passover Shalom and may our Father bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Father lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.